Heparin, uh, under mechanism of action, its big thing is it accelerates the effect of antithrombin 3. Uh, well, we don't call it antithrombin 3. That's how I learned it. They just call it antithrombin now. So if you see with that picture to the left or to the right, uh, all the different factors that antithrombin has effect on. Uh, so it's a very effective um, anticoagulant. Um, so it, in looking at that little picture, I don't think I so you've got heparin plus antithrombin three. You inhibit the production of thrombin. So the the uh, conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin goes down. So the ability to do a clot or uh, to make a clot goes down. At the bottom of that page on the right-hand corner, you see the very same thing, just uh, given a little bit different picture of heparin uh, binding with uh, antithrombin and inhibiting the activity of thrombin. So how, where do we use this? Well, acute treatment uh, or prophylaxis. So treatment in terms of if someone comes in with a, um, a um, embolic event, let's say they got a DVT, PE, you can put them on heparin and you get effect immediately. What effect do you get? The effect that you're going for is to stop the clot for, uh, propagation. It will not take care of the clot. It doesn't have any plasmin type of activity. Okay? So as simply as you want to arrest any kind of growth or extension of that, of that clot. The other would be for prophylaxis. So if someone comes in, they're high risk, we're gonna put it, they're gonna have surgery, then they're gonna be immobilized, or we're putting them in something that immobilizes them. Then we can use it for prophylaxis. Most hospitals now will have protocols uh, in terms of patients that are admitted that are going to be at higher risk and, and starting uh, a heparin, whether it be an unfractionated or a low molecular weight. Uh, disseminated, disseminated intravascular coagulation is another <coughs> indication for heparin. Uh, using it to flush um, catheter lines. So I don't, didn't know if you all were, knew what they were talking about with that. So when you, uh, when you put a, an IV line in or a port uh, of some kind that you're wanting to maintain the patency of it, then we can use heparin to flush it. Uh, so you see there's, this is uh, where it's entering the body, here is, uh, you've got a small amount of tubing, and then you have a port here through a lure lock that you can unscrew things and screw it in and push medications through or hook up an IV tube. So uh, people sometimes draw blood through that, they deliver drugs through it, it can clot off. So most hospitals, again, will have a protocol, or the ones I've worked in, have protocols of how often you flush the different lines, a pick line or a, um, or a port or an IV line. So um, this is what a, an IV or a heparin flush looks like. It's about 100 units. So it's a very small amount um, of heparin that we would use to flush that line air periodically um, in order to maintain the patency. So that's what that's talking about in terms of venous catheter occlusion. Atrial fib, if someone comes in and you're wanting immediate <coughs> anticoagulation, you can use a heparin. Uh, cardiac surgery, uh, it's used. Uh, also, we talked about acute coronary syndrome, right? One of the drugs you add right away with an antiplatelet uh, and aspirin is uh, a heparin. Contraindication. If they're actively bleeding, you do not want to give them heparin. Yes, there would be a history of HIT. We'll talk about HIT in just a minute, but it's a heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Um, and it, it can be deadly, so you certainly would want to know. I think uh, patients will tell you if they've had one that would be significant enough that they would know. Okay, onset of action, it's immediate, so you can start getting effect right away. Now, time to get full therapeutic effect usually will take about 24 hours. And that will be through your looking at their, um, their uh, partial thromboplastin time and adjusting the dose um, based on that. In terms of offset of action, its half-life is only about 45 minutes. So if you had to take someone to surgery, if you had to, like when we talked about um, 
um, putting in a stent or taking somebody for a coronary uh, revascularization. This drug, can you can turn it on and off pretty quickly. So that's one of its advantages. It's very pro highly protein bound. It has lots of variations between patients. So it's not real predictable if I give Paul a dose versus uh, Hannah a dose, it would be very different. Uh, the effects that you would get, the effects that you would get. So that's, that's one of the problems, is that it does take a lot of titration to get uh, the effect you're wanting. Uh, it can be used in renal impairment. Now this is a big advantage because low molecular weight heparin cannot be. Uh, some of the oral agents cannot be, uh, so that's an advantage and one to, to keep in mind. In terms of monitoring for efficacy, we use the APTT. Uh, it is measured in seconds. I brought you a, a uh, this is an outpatient, but it kind of gives you an idea of what a, uh, a result would look like. Now in the, in the computer, it would look a whole lot different. So here's the name of the of the test. Here it gives you the results. Flagging would be if it's too high, too low, out of range, they'll flag it. They'll put some type of marker there. And then they're telling you the number of units, which is in seconds, and then a reference interval. So the institutions you work in will have different reference intervals. Okay, uh, They will be close, uh, but you should go by what they have done, because they calibrated their machines and they've measured it in um, they're following good practices, then they will, that will be a reliable uh, reference numbers for you. Here is an abnormal. Uh, so here you've got someone whose results are outside the uh, reference. Uh, and this would be compared to note somebody who's not on anticoagulant. So there they flag it as high. Okay, under goal. So the goal of the of the APTT is you want it one and a half to two and a half times baseline. Not their baseline, the reference range baseline. Okay. Usually we, we will draw this about every six hours while the person's on it until they till they stabilize. If you look at the next page, there is a, uh, an example of a heparin titration protocol there. It's not meant for you to memorize, it is meant to show you how it's done, how we do this. So a baseline, it's a weight based. So we're first of all, we're going to give them a bolus so that we get a big effect first. And the, the uh, dose is 80 units per kilo. Then we're going to start them on an infusion. So we're going to have an IV bag with heparin in it, we've got an IV line established, we're going to hook them up and we're going to run it through a pump at this rate. Okay. In six hours we're going to draw lab and see where they are. Then we're going to make adjustments. So this shows you what, uh, what uh, the recommendations for this protocol is. So if they're still near normal, then we're going to give them another bolus and we're going to increase the infusion rate. We'll recheck them again in six hours. Once they, the, they start moving out, we're not going to do that bolus anymore. So we're only going to do the bolus as long as they're sub-therapeutic, below the goal that has been established. And then adjust the infusion rate. And once we get them to stay in that range of 1.5 to 2.5 baseline, then we'll leave them alone for as long as we are going to have them on the on the infusion. If they're too high, we'll dial the infusion down. I'll go back up to monitoring toxicity in just a minute. So we can, so that's IV. We can use this subcutaneously. It's slower onset. So if they're coming in and they've got a, um, a DVT and we want to treat them, we can give them an IV bolus or we can do subcutaneous. You see the dose is different there. And then we put them on a subcutaneous dose on a twice daily basis. We still use APTT to monitor until we take them off. 
If they're going to be on it uh, to cover the initiation of oral therapy, then that's usually about five to seven days. But I'll tell you that for the most part, Lovinox or Enoxaparin has replaced this approach. Uh, if they're in the hospital or they're under uh, home care, uh, we can use the subcutaneous as prophylaxis, and we would do that. Uh, we would use a sub-Q instead of an IV. It's effective, don't have to put an IV in with all the problems that could come in. Renal impairment, you don't have to adjust. That's a big thing, keep it in mind. Going back up for toxicity, one of the things we will look at is because bleeding is the number one side effect, then we're going to follow their hemoglobin hematocrit platelets. <coughs> Heparin can cause a thrombocytopenia, so monitoring the platelets is important. Okay, down to add, so questions about that? So I'll give you a picture of how what we're doing with this. Adverse effects, bleeding, number one. And major bleed would be a bleed significant enough that you would have to make an intervention. So 1 to 5 percent. Minor bleeds, common, bleed out the side of, a, of where you inject them. Uh, if you're using sub-Q, you can get significant uh, bruising. <coughs> this would be common. Lovinox, you would see this. Um, doesn't look pretty, uh, might be a slightly painful, but it's, it, this is expected. This is what we would expect to, to happen. If we had to use it long term, then osteoporosis is a problem with long term heparin, three to six months. So we can use heparin in pregnancy. We can't use the oral agents. So if we use heparin, uh, that might be an indication where you would use it for that length of time. Thrombocytopenia, this is really important. This is a drug-induced thrombocytopenia that is important to remember. It's most common with the unfractionated, less common with the, um, with the low molecular weights. There are two different types. So there's a non-immune type, common, more common than the immune type. So keep that in mind. Usually it's transient. So their platelets will drop. We call this HAT. Heparin associated thrombocytopenia. It's benign, transient, mild, usually their platelets don't fall below 100,000. What is a normal range of for platelets? 200 to 400,000. And usually it happens very early in therapy and they'll come right back. Okay, so that's common. The one that is, is more worrisome is the immune, and that's HIT, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Very important to remember. It's immune-mediated. Um, what happens is heparin forms a complex with this platelet factor 4, and that platelet factor 4 heparin complex is antigenic. So the immune system recognizes it as an antigen and will complex it, usually with IgG. This is a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. So one thing I would say is write yourself a note and say, go back and look at, at the, the lecture I gave you in module 1. Because here's a good example. It's, it's not uncommon, and it will drive home that type of reaction, because they're not that common but they often result in a cell line deficit like uh, platelets, thrombocytopenia. So what happens is because you've got that um, complex uh, and it often attaches to the platelets is the body will clear it more quickly. Uh, so you get a drop in platelet numbers. It can ha happen on the arterial side or the venous side. The odd thing about it is that it's bleeding is not the problem, it's thrombosis. They form clots. <clears throat> so remember platelets have the ability to produce procoagulants. And it's thought that that's what happens, is that you get a lot, you get a dump of these uh, procoagulants and so they get more clotting. So you would think that if you don't have platelets, you would bleed, but it, that is not the case. It is clot, so it's thrombosis, <coughs> not bleeding. Incidence is about 2 to 3%. 
So the problem is, is that people can die from it. So it is a lethal complication. Or if it causes an arterial <coughs> illness, then they could, it could lead to limb ischemia. They could have um, amputation. If it occurs in the heart, it can lead to an MI or a stroke in the brain. If it occurs in the venous side, then uh, PEs are con common complications, and death is a common complication of that. So it can also you know, cause heparin-induced skin lesions. Um, those toes are purple and red mottled. Um, sorry, I didn't, I didn't put it in the slide. So diagnosis is an absolute thrombocytopenia. So platelets less than uh, 150, 150,000 or more, greater than a 50% decrease from baseline usually occurs days after they've started, so five to ten days. However, if they have had uh, heparin before, that would be a heparin naive. If they've had heparin before, it can occur within 12 hours. Initial diagnosis is clinical confirmation. You can draw uh, uh, heparin-induced uh, antibodies. Questions about those? Really important complication or side effect. Treatment, uh, you stop the heparin. You can treat them with an alternative. You could use uh, bivalrudin, uh, fondaparinex, uh, so one of the other non-heparin uh, agents. Often we will overlap when we stay, if we're going to use warfarin for a DVT tr uh, treatment, we will usually start heparin and warfarin at the same time because that gives us uh, the five to seven days we need for warfarin to be effective. In this case, you would stop the warfarin and wait until the thrombocytopenia resolves. We don't get platelet transfusions, uh, it just makes the situation worse. So it's support in, uh, uh, until the patient can uh, recover. Questions about that? Yes. It's a little bit of a monitoring question. So you know, kind of like a real scenario, this would mostly be like this at the hospital. Yes. Right? Yes. So you would be running like a CDC on them to monitor for the first couple of days? Yes. 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 There is a reversal agent, and that's protamine sulfate. That's an important one to remember. So let's say they, um, they had an exaggerated response, their BTT went out a lot further than you'd expected, and they start having some bleeding, you can use protamine to uh, reverse the effects of the heparin. Uh, going back up to drug interactions, there aren't that many uh, with heparin. The, the major would be more for what we would call pharmacodynamic, uh, drugs that do the same thing. So drugs that also interfere with the uh, coagulation cascade or plate, uh, platelets, so non steroids aspirin. Uh, there, it's not that you can't use them together, but you have to be aware. Increased risk of bleeding, so because they both share common um, effects, then their risk of side effects goes up. Real world application, so quick onset, quick offset. That's something to remember with heparin. You can get tight control very quickly with this drug. Uh, you can monitor it, that's an advantage. Um, it's, not, it's less expensive than all the alternatives, except for warfarin. Um, not limited in renal failure. Big advantage over the other agents. Questions? Okay. Low molecular weight heparin. So we use this one a lot on an outpatient basis. So if you're not in a hospital, you were likely to see the low molecular weight heparins. Uh, their action, they interact with antithrombin uh, just like heparin does, uh, but they are more specific for factor 10A instead of thrombin. That's the predominant difference between low molecular weight and uh, unfractionated. 
So how do we use them? Well, acute treatment, we can treat a DVT, comes in through the emergency room, you can start them on this, also an oral agent and send them out the door. You can use them for prophylaxis. Um, as I said, the oncologists tend to like this over oral agents or heparin, so you can use them uh, in pregnancy, you can use them for uh, patients who have cancers uh, as well. Uh, this one doesn't cross the placenta, so you don't anticoagulate the, the fetus. So it happens the same way. Uh, history of HIT. Uh, so you do not see HIT uh, to the same extent with low molecular weight as you do with an infraction, but it's still a possibility. Active bleeding would be a problem. Spinal punctures. Uh, this is a black box warning, but it's not an absolute contraindication. So the risk of bleed, I didn't put it in uh, <coughs> Always important when you've uh, got somebody on anticoagulant and you're having to do a spinal puncture is the risk of bleeding. The, the products that are available are anoxaparin, Lovinox, probably the most common of the ones used. It's also generic, still expensive. Um, Daltaparin or Fragment and Intensaparin, uh, which is, I don't know. But by far, it's anoxaparin that people, people use. Kinetics, uh, onset is slower than unfractionated, so two to four hours. It's only used subcutaneous. Half-life is about seven hours. So if you are, so here would be a common scenario. Uh, somebody is going for a procedure, they're anticoagulated. It's deemed that the risk of them being off an anticoagulant is uh, that it's higher for an embolic. Uh, their embolic risk is high compared to the surgery that's being done or the procedure that's being done. So we may take them off the oral agent and put them on uh, this uh, low molecular weight heparin for uh, a few days and then right, uh, about 24 hours before the procedure we would stop it. They can do the procedure then we can start the anticoagulant right back. So that's what that's referring to. Clarence is predominantly renal. You have to know their renal function before you start the drug. Interpatient variability is low, so that's a difference compared to unfractionated heparin. Uh, dosing, here's another example. So it's weight based, but instead of units per kilo, it's milligrams per kilo. And you'll see that the dosing is every 12 hours for the most part when you're treating. If you're prophylaxing, um, you, in some instances, you can do once a day. Um, adverse effects, bleeding, similar to the unfractionated epidural hematomas around spinal procedures, uh, is a uh, risk, hit less common than the unfractionated. Drug interactions, again, are more pharmacodynamic. Now, we haven't talked about that as much. When we talk about it, we usually are talking about kinetic interactions, pharmacokinetic. You're interfering with the clearance, the metabolism, the elimination of drugs. Pharmacodynamic in, uh, drug interactions are when the drug that you're using with it is going to do the same thing. So you can get exaggerated pharmacologic effect and exaggerated adverse effects. So again, if a drug causes bleeding and you're using it with a heparin, then the risk of bleeding goes up. That's, that's what that boils down to. Same kind of uh, monitoring, so hemoglobin hematocrit if you're going to have them on long-term platelets. You need a serum creatinine uh, to uh, determine renal function. This is platelets every other day until discontinued. Uh, I would say that's probably not done in practice very often. Uh, maybe if they're in the hospital, but on an outpatient basis, we, we don't do that as often. Periodic hemoglobin hematocrit, especially if they're showing some signs of, um, of a bleed. How do we monitor for efficacy? Well, so a couple things. Renal insufficiency, we don't want to use it. Pregnancy can be used. Weight. Weight will affect this drug. So the very skinny and the very obese probably have... Um, The obese, the worry is less than optimal anticoagulation. It's always an issue about how do we dose morbidly obese folks. Uh, because the, we, we, we're not going to take them up to a milligram per kilo. We just don't. 
uh, but we do it on more than uh, their, uh, their uh, ideal body weight. Pediatrics, uh, also the guidelines uh, are not as um, well fleshed out as you see with adults, so monitoring may be appropriate there. So here we don't use uh, an activated partial throttle blasting time. The, if you have to use some type of monitoring, then you would use this anti-factor 10A. You can order it. It's not very common uh, monitoring. But in these situations where you've got very obese people, pregnant woman, or a kid, then you may want to uh, use that monitor. It does have a reversal agent, so it does have protein. The last on the top of page 17 is a comparison between the unfractionated and low molecular weight. It goes down and, and just summarizes what we have talked about. That last, the advantages uh, on that prophylaxis, what I was, I, I just left off IV push or flush. Uh, so you might want to change that. Otherwise, the low molecular weight heparins have the advantage for the most part in this situation. They are more expensive. <coughs> Real world application. So acute, um, so for acute anticoagulation of a DVT or a, or a uh, embolic event. Uh, more commonly used now in inpatient than uh, unfractionated. Monitoring for efficacy is not as um, easy, easy uh, and is less frequently used. Cost can be a barrier. Uh, before it went generic, a box of 10 was about $800. Of 10. You know what it is now? Did you all carry it? A lot of pharmacies we don't carry it. Do. I worked there for a year and a half, and the only time we ever dispensed it was last December when I guess people had met their deductible and they were getting surgery. But it wasn't, it wasn't too bad on insurance, the generic. So um, in our co-ed clinic, we used it a lot. So we knew the pharmacies that would carry it. So, and a lot of them don't. So don't give the patient a prescription and tell them to go get it. Uh, know the pharmacy carries it. Some pharmacies carry them. Some pharmacies can, will order it and get it in in 24 hours. But if you want the patient to have it that day, you need to know the pharmacies that will stock it. Okay, any questions about those? Jim? Um, for, I just have a question about the weight base. So you said, do you use the ideal body weight? No. Up to about 150 kilos you'll use. That's the highest dose. It's, I think the highest is 150 uh, in a syringe. And usually, like, you know, when you're inpatient, you have all the charts and everything, it's pretty much automatic calculations, right? For how much you're supposed to give somebody. Your, your hospital may have a protocol that you would go by, especially for the um, unfractionated heparin. For the, uh, for the low molecular weight, it's a milligram per kilo, usually. And then what depends on if you're going to use it once a day or twice a day. Okay, the last one in this group is uh, uh, Arixtra. It's a 10A inhibitor only. It is really a second line. If you don't, can't use the other drugs, you would use this one. Uh, It can be used for treatment or prophylaxis of a, of a DVT or a PE. It has the same contraindications that uh, low molecular weights do. Uh, onset is it's very similar to, um, to what we, we just talked about. But if you could not use, if they had a history of HIP, you could use this. So there, mechanism action, real world, um, if you look on the next page. Sorry, can't use it yet, but you can with normal side Real world use, let's go down to it. Similar efficacy to the low molecular weight. Shares advantages of the, over, of the low molecular weights over the unfractionated. Uh, it's the alternate, uh, so here's one place, if they have a porcine allergy or they want to avoid um, pork because of dietary or religious reasons, this is a drug that you could use. 
So heparin, uh, heparin is usually either beef-based or, or pork. You can get beef-based uh, heparin uh, as an alternative as well. Longer half-life makes offset longer, and it does not have a reversal agent. So it doesn't have a big place, but it is an alternative out there if you uh, had reasons that you couldn't use it. Okay, let's go on to warfarin. So a drug that's been around a long time, since the 1950s, uh, been used for all manner of uh, embolic events. Uh, most people know it's, the, it's similar to the ingredient in rat poison. It's how you kill the rat and they bleed to death as they eat it. Um, you can see there it was approved in 1954 and the next oral anticoagulant was not approved till 2010. So um, lots of, of um, experience with, with this drug. Uh, it is frequently used in the treatment of uh, DVTs, PEs, um, heart valve patients, uh, stroke prevention and AFib, all of those, uh, it, is, it works well. It's a vitamin K antagonist, so it hits those vitamin K dependent uh, clotting factors. And it's going to hit the, the, the new ones, um, or the, sorry, it won't hit the circulating, it hits the production of new ones. One of the bad things it does is it also decreases protein C and protein S production. So that's not so much a problem for us in the long run, but in the short term, protein C has a very short half-life. So when you start warfarin, you knock it out pretty quickly. So, and you also knock out uh, factor seven. Remember I told you factor two has a very long half-life. So if you, in the initial <laughs> treatment with warfarin in that first week, you can actually see an increase in clot. That's why we always cover it with a heparin when we're starting. And we usually keep the heparin five to seven days until the warfarin takes effect and their INR has reached at least a level of two. I've written that down later in the, uh, in the handout. Okay, indications. So I've, I've talked about that as cardio, cardio uh, embolic strokes, uh, prevention and treatment of uh, uh, DVTs or PEs. It is, and this is an important one, it is the only oral anticoagulant that is approved for heart valves. Never, never, unless there's new information that comes out, but I think that that is, is put to rest. You never use the newer agents for heart valve patients. It's always working. They didn't bear out in, uh, in, in trials. So there's no off-level <coughs> use for those in, in heart valves. Okay. Prevention of secondary stroke, prevention of recurrent MIs also is another place that it's been used. We don't use it in pregnancy because it is, it has, it's a le level X or category X, the old category. Uh, fetal warfarin syndrome, this takes place in the first um, trimester. Um, and you can see the, the different problems uh, with limbs, the CMS, the eyes, the facial features. So cannot be used in pregnancy, very teratogenic. So in women that are on warfarin that are childbearing years, we strongly, strongly are pushing adequate birth control. They cannot use estrogen products because it increases clotting factors. So we're usually looking at like the pl implantable progestin, long acting progestins. Uh, contraindications, um, it's someone who's a high risk for a major bleed. History of a warfarin induced skin necrosis or purple toe syndrome. Not very common, but uh, it does happen. They form these little micro clots in the little blood vessels, and uh, it often shows up in the toes. Uh, they'll know if they've had purple toe syndrome, it, it's striking. Uh, quinidine is another one that can do that as well. Um, okay, so uh, onset, so we talked about warfarin takes days to um, onset, about five, uh, five to seven based on clotting factor half-life is the reason. Offset is slow. Uh, so if somebody is on warfarin and they're going to go and have a surgery, 
usually the person who's, who is uh, instructing them will tell them, I want you off, I want you to stop the war for five days before. Unless you are, if you ever tell a patient that with warfarin, you should always refer them back to who is responsible for that warfarin. Uh, because you're not, if you're doing some procedure, the GI folks are, are the uh, very common. They're going to come in and do a col uh, colonoscopy, they tell them to stop it for five days before. No assessment of risk, no assessment of what their likelihood of throwing a clot is, none. So it really needs to go back to the people who are monitoring it and then a decision can be made as to risk and whether or not to cover them during that time that they're off with something like Lovenox. So that's, that's the reason why the, it's typical that patients are told to stop it five days before a procedure. Warfarin has a very narrow therapeutic index. What does that mean? Toxicity. Toxicity and therapeutic effect overlap or very close together. So this is a continuum. What we're doing is that we are just extending the length of time it takes for blood to clot. We're on a continuum. Uh, so at some point, it gets to be too much, and the person can then uh, have major bleeds and, uh, and suffer due to that. So regular monitoring is pivotal. There are guidelines that come out for the use of uh, anticoagulants in chest regular, on a regular basis. And chest, last chest guidelines came out and said people on warfarin should be monitored every four weeks at the, at the maximum. Okay. So we may see people every one to two weeks, but four weeks is what is recommended that they go no longer than that. Unless they're extremely stable and they could go out 12 weeks. I'll tell you that's very rare. Uh, most people will benefit from every, if, uh, no, no, going no longer than four weeks in between uh, INR checks. It's metabolized extensively. 2C9 is one of the major, uh, we don't talk about that one as much, but it's the major pathway. But you'll see it's, it's, uh, uh, it is metabolized by multiple pathways. So it's a red flag warning. Warfarin interacts with everything. Everything affects warfarin. Uh, so it's really important if you're dealing with a person on warfarin and you're going to add something is that you know what it's going to do. The other thing you should always tell them is that if they're being monitored by a group, um, a specialized group, tell them. You need to call and tell them. We always told our patients, anybody adds a drug to you, call them, call us. We'll tell you whether it needs um, extra monitoring or a change in your dose. Very, very important. The way it is monitored is an INR. Have you talked about INRs? Yes. Okay, good. So what do you know about them? They're part of a TINR test. <laughs> Everybody in here, unless you're on an anticoagulant, has an INR of one. So it is a, it's a referenced uh, lab. Uh, that compares the bleeding time of somebody on that drug to someone who is not on that drug. Okay, so the reference is, is one. So most, um, so the, the range or the therapeutic range or index that you want for that patient is based on the indication <coughs> why they're using it. So most people who have had DVTs or PEs are going to have a, an INR goal or target of, of two to three. Most mechanical valves are going to be two and a half to three and a half. Some people who have, and I didn't put this in here, you don't have to note it, but I'm just giving you examples. Some hypercoagulable states will have uh, INR ranges as high as three and a half to four and a half. That's about as high as they go. If it is below <coughs> the target range, we call that subtherapeutic. If it is above the target range, we call it super, super therapy. That will differ based on the range that is the target for them. Large inter-patient uh, variability with warfarin. Uh, usually when we start, we will, if we're starting a naive patient, we'll start with 5 to 10 milligrams 
uh, and we'll do that for one to three days, and we'll check an INR. We'll check an INR the first day to see. The faster they move out, usually the lower the dose they will need. Uh, when we would see somebody new on warfarin, we might uh, check an INR every two or three days until we start to see it stabilizing. In older people, it takes a lot longer for them to reach um, a steady state. Um, so then once we start seeing it stabilize, then we would start moving into weekly. And, as, and then it may take three or four months for them to, us to get them to where they're every four weeks. So it takes a lot of monitoring. I would highly advise that if you have people on warfarin and they're under your purview, is that you get them in a special clinic. Uh, the drug is just too variable. It's, it, and it requires a lot of education for the patient, and they have to be seen frequently. Uh, so they'll eat your time. They'll eat up your, your book if you carry a big, um, a big clinic. In this city, there are three of them. Uh, Baptist Integris has one, Southwest uh, Baptist has one, and ODU uh, in the Family Medicine Center has one. That's pretty much for warfarin. The other uh, newer uh, anticoagulants don't have anything to monitor. There's nothing you can check. Uh, so they, they usually aren't in a specialized clinic. For people who live out in uh, the very rural areas, there are, um, sometimes you can get special uh, permission to uh, get them a meter, and they can check their INR at home and call in results. The downside on that is that the reimbursement is terrible. And so, again, they eat up your time. If they're out of range, then uh, it takes some time to figure out how to move them back into range. As long as the person is on uh, warfarin, they will need INR, or ch INR checks. Um, the etiology is always important. Sometimes people can be in range and the dose be wrong. Let's say they've been non-adherent and they're in range, there's something wrong. If they go back to taking the regular dose, they'll be too high. Uh, so there's lots of reasons, uh, or lots of things that influence that INR, and so it needs to be interpreted by folks who are um, well trained in, in that area. Um, adverse effects, major bleed, so that's the, are, are not that common, minor bleeds are common. So uh, asking people about, are you, have you seen blood in your urine or your feces? Uh, have you, are you, uh, when you brush your teeth? Uh, are your gums bleeding, uh, nose bleeds? Those would be common, <coughs> common areas for people to uh, complain about bleeding on, uh, on warfarin. Warfarin interactions, uh, again, there are pharmacokinetic interactions and there are pharmacodynamic interactions. So pharmacokinetic would be inhibition of, of warfarin. So look there. If warfarin is around longer, then the INR goes up, which means they're more likely to bleed. If you induce the metabolism, uh, warfarin metabolism is accelerated, you can see a reduction in INR. Alteration in absorption. Put them on some drug that slows down their gut. Then they may not be completely absorbed, and so INR goes down. You displace them from protein binding sites. More uh, warfarin is available to move into uh, the liver, and so INR goes up. So see lots of lots of interactions. That's why people abandon it and go on to the newer agents. Pharmacodynamic interactions, again, it is the drug doing something similar to what the warfarin does. And so you get an increase in therapeutic effect or in um, side effects. Common drug interactions are listed down there. You are responsible for those. The reason is because they are so damn common. And I cannot tell you, to be on the receiving end of them in a coag clinic, how many times they are a problem. Uh, because people don't ask, they don't tell. Um, if you start a drug, you can always call um, pharmacies in your building. Uh, your apps will tell you there's a major drug interaction. Um, but these are the big ones, fluconazole, the azoles, huge interactions with uh, warfarin. 
Bactrim, the worst. Amiodarin, the worst. Okay. Both of those require immediate changes in the dose of warfarin. Aspirin is, is not so much of a problem, it just increases the risk of a bleed. The antileptics, um, so uh, carbamazepine, inducing metabolism, driving the iron iron down. This is important. It happens all the time. I've seen people have bleeds, major bleeds. I've seen people have major embolic events because drugs were added on, they got sub-therapeutic, sub and they had a clot. Very important. Okay. Next page, let's talk about di dietary vitamin K. So, you can out-eat this drug. You can eat so much vitamin K, broccoli. I had a lady who used to eat a huge bowl of broccoli every day. She always could out-eat her vitamin her or So, you can out-eat this drug. You can give the liver so much vitamin K that it just laughs at the warfarin and moves on. <laughs> it's like that. Okay. So, the one thing I hate to hear is getting patients from a, 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 a provider that said, I can't eat. I can't eat dark leafy green vegetables anymore. Uh, and I know why they do it. I know that the provider just does not want to mess with the dietary impact on warfarin. I get it. But there is no reason to do that. Um, that's again a, a reason to get them into a specialized clinic. Uh, inconsistent amounts of vitamin K just cause that INR to go up and down, up and down, up and down. And so it gets very hard to interpret what is what dose is really needed. So consistent vitamin K intake is what you're going for. So we don't want people to abandon good healthy eating. We want them to know how to choose it and how many servings a week they can do. We always ask people, what do you want to eat? And then we titrated them against that. But the thing for them is it had to be consistent. And that's where the, the difficulty sometimes comes in. Foods with high vitamin K intake usually are the dark leafy greens. So broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, spinach are high. Cabbage, even though it's not dark green, it's very high in vitamin K. Some um, over-the-counter diet supplements like Ensure, uh, the liquids, are also tend to be high in vitamin K. They use a lot of that for meal replacements. It can also cause a problem. Romaine lettuce, very high. Liver, very high. So we teach patients how to how to um, interchange those and how to be consistent in their servings. That's that's the goal. Other food effects: cranberry hated when Thanksgiving came around because when people eat lots of uh, cranberries, <laughs> juice in particular, but also the uh, the berries, it inhibits warfarin metabolism and their INRs go up. Grapefruit products, I, I, you know, more modest, I just tell them to avoid it. I'll also tell them to avoid the uh, cranberry juice. Alcohol. Alcohol is wicked because it does multiple things. Acutely, it will cause the liver, um, it will uh, inhibit warfarin metabolism in their INR spike. So people who binge the night before they came in to get an INR check, they're always high. Um, so binging or acute alcohol intake will, um, will affect warfarin metabolism. Chronic induces the enzymes, and so all you have to do is titrate against it if you're willing to, if, that's, if they're going to chronically drink alcohol and you can't get them to change. So al alcohol has different versus acute versus chronic. A lot of diseases affect warfarin. See, from a pharmacist standpoint, we love all this stuff. But I think y'all are sitting there going, there's no way in hell I'll ever wear these things. Okay, fever increases metabolism. Diarrhea, they don't absorb it. Acute illnesses affect food intake. I can always tell when we move from summer to winter because people eat more fat, they absorb more vitamin K in the winter. And so we had to change the dose during the winter time. Heart failure exacerbations will increase the INR because of the congestion in the liver. Hepatic disease. Most people with hepatic disease are not on warfarin because they don't make that much clotting factor and that goes down. So that's usually not so much of a problem. Changes in thyroid status will change clotting factor metabolism. So if they're hyperthyroid uh, or you go up on their thyroid, uh, 
then their, their INR will um, go up and down with hypothyroidism. The key would be is if you're changing somebody's thyroid and you know they're on warfarin, tell them to call the provider who's managing their own warfarin. Adherence makes a difference. One missed dose can have a major effect on uh, warfarin or on the INR. So you're responsible for what is in that chart. Changes in dietary vitamin K, what's the INR likely to be? Diarrhea, what's likely Bactrim? Chronic Bactrim, we're not so concerned about, and non -steroidals. Now, a lot of drugs, if people have to be on them chronically, like amiodarone, we just titrate the worker into a different dose, and they can uh, tolerate it. It does have a reversal agent, that's good news, vitamin K. So we can give people vitamin K. The only thing is it makes them resistant. Uh, so then for several days, they, they are not covered because they, um, their liver can make as many clotting factors as it wants. All right, questions about warfarin. So you won't see it as often, but your heart valve patients will have it. Um, and it's cheap. You can get a month's worth at, at Walmart for $4. So it is, it, it's a less expensive. The monitoring is some, but it, the monitoring is not that high. Um, so it's a less expensive, but a lot more, um, a lot more factors. Okay, so let's look at the, the newer agents then. So we have direct thrombin inhibitors, like the Bigotran. And since we're short on time, we'll go to page 24, we have the uh, factor 10 -A. So um, Pradaxa has fallen somewhat out of favor because of some of the post-marketing. So let's look over at the um, factor 10 on page 24. There's three of them. There's Lorelto, Aliquis, and Cervasa. You see them on TV all the time. So these are factor 10 inhibitors. They selectively block the active site for factor uh, 10. Their mechanism is independent of antithrombin. Indication. You'll see them a lot for AFib, non-valvular AFib. These cannot be used in mechanical heart valves. They can be used to treat DVTs, PEs, prevention, all of that. They can't be used in renal insufficiency. So that is one of the problems. Um, the one I want you to uh, focus on is a Pixaban or Eliquis because a Doxaban has some weird stuff. If the renal function is too high, they, it's, it's less effective. It's, a, it's one of the strange ones. Um, so let's, let's just for this look at um, a Pixaban. You look on page 25 in terms of lab monitoring. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, there's nothing to monitor. There's no, uh, nothing that will tell us what type of activity it's having against uh, 10A. So that's good in terms of patients don't have to go in for frequent monitoring. It's bad because you don't know what happens. Uh, the other is that you don't know what the influence of, of non-adherence is uh, either. There is no reversal agent except for Prodexa. Uh, so there are the downsides uh, to it. Um, under a Pixaban, you'll, one thing to take away is that depending on the indication will dictate the, the dose. And it can, and age, other factors, renal function and age can affect the, uh, the dosing as well. The other is that um, a Pixaban doesn't require you to overlap with a parenteral Anticoagulant, so that's an advantage to it. So you can start. They come in DVT. You can start them. FDA is approved to start and orally treat somebody. You don't have to put them on um, uh, a, a, a heparin. Look on page 26. So they also have fewer drug interactions. However, the longer they've been used, some, there have been some interactions that have come up. I would still say you need to look, but they are not anywhere near uh, the problem that you see with Warfarin. The azoles can be a problem. 
Um, that's about it. Uh, look under real world, world use. Advantages over warfarin. Uh, no monitoring. Uh, less side of the, usually less bleeding and less uh, drug interactions. Disadvantages are uh, no reversal agent. The other advantage is no uh, parenteral anticoagulation. Renal function is still a problem. Can't use it for heart valves. Questions about those? Okay. Treatment concepts, I would read through there. What I did is I took each of the big concepts and, and broke it down in terms of how it, what the approach to treatment is. Uh, so treatment for acute, uh, either a DVT or an arterial uh, thrombus. The different modalities, non-pharmacologic effects or uh, interventions. Uh, so the next two pages are summaries of what I have said, but it puts it more under the disease itself or the condition uh, itself. On the very last page, oh, let me look at page 29 real quick. I put a, a chart in that shows you uh, duration of treatment. So what I want you to take away from this is that at the top, if you've got first provoked or unprovoked, the duration is usually short, kind of shows you, I'm not going to ask you INR uh, target ranges. Um, at the bottom, it's, it shows you more the recurrent or the, or the types of VTEs that are going to require chronic. That means lifelong. So it's either you're on it for a short period of time or you're taking it forever. And you see also that the INR uh, ranges change. And your heart valves are going to have your lungs. On the very last page, did y'all talk about Hasbled? Okay. So Hasbled, so we use the CHADS valves to determine embolic risk. Hasbled uh, does uh, estimates of bleeding risk. So what I want you to know is what each of those stand for. So H is hypertension, A is abnormal renal function, S is stroke history, B is bleeding history, L is labile, E is elderly, over 65, drugs that increase bleeding risk. So you can see under the Hasblood score, the higher that dose it, or sorry, the higher the score is, the higher the risk of having a bleed. So in a clinic that is managing these folks, they're going to do both. They're going to look at Chad's Vask and they're going to look at Has Blood, and they're going to look at what is a person's risk for a bleed, what's a risk for uh, an embolic event. Again, where it comes into play is what if they're coming in subtherapeutic? If their risk for a stroke are, is lower than their risk for a bleed, then you may not do anything about it. You might give them a boost of a drug and then bring them back shortly if, you're, if you've got a monitoring parameter and, and monitor them. That's the problem with the newer agents is you don't have that. If they're sub, is super, super therapeutic, then what's their bleed risk to their clot risk? Should the dose be adjusted down? Should they be given a reversal agent? That's where these things become important. So they're tools to use and I've got data behind them. Okay, questions? A lot of stuff. <laughs> You're so good. So, I'm sorry we rushed through the newer agents. They're fairly straightforward. Just look at, look at what I, I have given you in the handout. All is the same form. Okay, I probably will write, stick with the big concepts. Every handout I gave you is big. If it, the very first part over the, um, uh, the background, the physiology, pathophysiology, I am not going to ask you about that. I gave it to you as, as, as uh, context. Okay. So my focus is on the drug part. So look at the major concepts. Don't miss those. If you miss the more minor things, 
that are more complex, I'm like, okay, but when you mix, mix, miss the big stuff, that's what concerns me. Will any of the information over the Abigatrian be on the test? Yes. Okay. Even yeah, that section is going to be on. Okay. That's the production. You ought, to, you ought to have some idea of that. We'll use a uh, mix of man. I'll send that out as a notes for you to miss. All right. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. But yeah, everything yeah. is good. What about the black? Yeah, I don't know. I oh, no, no. But I just, I went in and declined it all.